Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again to another episode of As I Live in Grief. You hear me say it every week. This week's no different, so I'll just get right to it. I have a great guest for you to listen to today. Her name is Victoria Noe. She is an author. She is definitely a specialist in the area of grief, and we're going to talk about a rather specific focus today, and that's grief over the loss of our friends and how that can feel, and how we can move through it, and why at times this can be every bit as devastating as the grief of someone who seemingly is much closer to us, but friends are very important in our lives. So, hi, Victoria. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks for inviting me, Kathy. I'm glad to be here. Absolutely. Our pleasure, indeed. So, before we actually get started on the topic of friends' grief, Would you give our listeners just a little bit of your background, please? Sure. I I tell people I'm uniquely qualified to talk about grief. I have two degrees in theater. I have no training in grief studies or thanatology, none of that. But I've lost friends, as we all have. And in 2006, I was having tea after school drop-off with a friend of mine. And um, I told her I had this weird idea for a book about stories of people grieving their friends. And she's like, oh, do it. And I said, I've never written a book before. And she said, that's okay, just do it. And um, six months later, she was dead from ovarian cancer that had come back one too many times. I didn't know how to write a book. I didn't know anything about publishing So it took me a few years to get going to figure out what I was doing. And um, the book turned out to be a series of six little books, each on a different topic or a different community, experiencing the grief of friend dying. The first one didn't come out until this month in 2013. So it's the first one is 10 years old this month. And over the next three years, I published five more in that series. While I was working on the last one, I got an idea for a slightly different book. I was attending a lecture in New York at the library with my daughter, who was in college at the time. And it was the Women of Act Up New York, the AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power, the activists who changed everything. And I'm a member of that chapter of Act Up. And the women were talking about the things they'd accomplished, like changing the definition of AIDS so that women could get disability, could get diagnosed, could get treated. And I sat there, I knew the stories, but I hadn't heard these women tell their own stories. And I thought, wow, someone should write a book about that. Not me, but someone should write a book. And I spent the next year trying to convince myself not to do it and finally gave in. And that book came out four years ago this month. And then COVID changed everything. And I'm currently finishing up a book about grieving friends who died during COVID. Any cause of death, not just COVID, because people died from other things. Right. Yet we were all kept from traditional forms of saying goodbye. Mm -hmm. I guess that's the best way I can sum it up. That um, the way restrictions were and everything we couldn't visit people in the hospital and everything so even though they may not have died of COVID itself COVID and the pandemic had a definite impact on our grief during that period of time right the risks were still there absolutely absolutely You mentioned your series of books on friend grief, and that's what it's called, the friend grief Mm -hmm. series. I was particularly drawn to the first book with the title and a comment that actually I read 
Um, when visiting with my best friend, Amazon, well, now Google's going to get jealous, but so what? And the first book in your series, your friend grief series, is called Friend Grief and Anger. When your friend dies and no one gives a damn. And you reference or you make a quote. I don't know if you said it or someone said it to you. But the quote is, it's not like they were family. Why does that inspire so much anger? Well, you know, there's this hierarchy of grief. And it's there whether we like it or not. We certainly saw it after 9-11, which is the subject of one of the books in the series. The families were everything. The families drove everything. And I met survivors who escaped from the World Trade Center who were not allowed to go to the observances on the anniversaries of 9-11 because they were not family members. They lost, you know, maybe everyone in their office, maybe a lot of the people in their office, their co-workers, they were not allowed because their grief was not considered as significant. I'm not here to diss the families in any circumstance, right. but, but to be continually pushed aside, why wouldn't you be angry? Absolutely. Absolutely. And friends are our family <clears throat> in many ways. I use the phrase extended family so many times because in truth, my extended family is huge is huge. I have a lot of people I care about. And certainly, if when one of them should die, I'm going to feel it. I'm going to feel the loss in many Mm -hmm. ways. And there are certainly members of my blood family that I'm not nearly as close to as Mm -hmm. some of my extended family. So why wouldn't we be upset? Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't we be angry? And you and I spoke briefly before we started to record the session. We talked briefly about things that people say. And there's this overwhelming urge, and I felt it myself at calling hours, that when you greet someone at calling hours or after knowing that they've lost someone near to them, you you feel like you have to say something. Unfortunately, what may come out of your mouth may not be something supportive, loving, or helpful in the least Mm -hmm. bit. And certainly a comment like, it's not as if they were family, is one of those comments. What other things might someone say that can cause some hurt? Can you think of anything else? But I think just the idea of that hierarchy again, that they may recognize that you're grieving, but they don't consider it a deep enough grief to compare to a family member. Because you're right, the assumption is that blood family, people we're related to, their deaths will cause a much stronger depth of grief. You know, in the LGBTQ community, It's called a family of choice, the people you surround yourself with who are supportive, the people you love. And I saw a lot of necessity for that in the early days of the AIDS epidemic because I was a fundraiser in that community. And I saw horrific things done by family members to people who were dying and unbelievable acts of love from people who were not. Okay. Is there any way you know of that we can, I guess, quantify or describe how friend grief is different from family grief? Well, I think, you know, the biggest way is that you have no standing. You have no rights. You know, we certainly saw during COVID a huge barrier to contact with friends. Even family members were restricted from visiting people in the hospital at all, from holding wakes and visitations, funerals, where participation in person was severely restricted. And no one thought about the friends. You know, the the emphasis was on the families. And again, I'm not 
dismissing that at all. But, you know, if they say one death results in nine people grieving, they're always talking about nine family members. Mm-hmm. You know, I've, um, with the book I'm writing now, I've done a lot of research, which is very new and I think was sparked by COVID about friendship and what our friends mean to us. And I think that, you know, when our culture has phrases like friends and loved ones, like, aren't your friends loved ones? <laughs> you know, um, And where we feel the need to say a friend is a best friend or a friend is like family, then we ourselves are dismissing the honor of calling someone a friend. Absolutely. Can friend grief then be occasionally, maybe not all the time, but occasionally a form of disenfranchised grief? Oh, it absolutely is. Easily dismissed, like the loss of a pet? It absolutely is. It's, um, you know, as you know, disenfranchised grief, you know, is grief that is not honored. Exactly. And I have felt this so much less during COVID because I think people, a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people have taken the last three years to examine their relationships and not just family relationships, but friends and the different sort of circles of friends we have. You know, it's not just the close friends that we miss. It was the people we see every day. We don't even know their names. You know, the baristas and the the guy you buy your paper from, you know, the the train conductor, whatever. I mean, we sort of consider them friends because they're part of our world. And that loss of contact has really, really had an effect on us. Sure it has. And it it has had especially an effect on our children. Mm. Um, You know, when they weren't able to go to school and they weren't Mm. able to socialize. Uh, I think we're we're seeing a huge trend in mental health issues. And, you know, I just think it's just now starting where questions are being raised about what impact exactly has the pandemic had mm-hmm. on us as a people. And that includes our children. I, right. I, I think the kids are still struggling with many, many things. I think we're all, we've been grieving for three years. We've had mental health issues for three years. Right. Our daughter is 28. She moved to South Korea to Daegu. The day, the day Daegu was considered the epicenter of the pandemic in South Korea. Now we didn't know that when we put her on the plane. It was three years ago last month. She taught English to Korean kids for two and a half years. They all wore masks. They only had to stop, close the school for a a few days, once or twice, the whole time. It was a very different experience for her there than here. But the mental health toll was very similar. And, um, you know, the fact that she was employed full time the whole pandemic, unlike her friends here, was only a little bit of consolation. Huh. Wow. Yeah, I, I think there are many, many more books to come um, a, about everything in general. Uh, and we talk, we have talked many times about grief not being just related to the death of a loved right. one, but also the loss of a lifestyle, the loss of a marriage, the loss of a job many, many things. Grief touches us. And especially when you consider the pandemic and what each and every single person lost, grief, I think, is a much more, not popular in the way that we like it, but much more common situation for people, whether they realize it or not. It's very pervasive because what they're grieving is the future they lost. Not just with with a person but with a job, right. with a career, with a community, exactly. so many things. Yep. yep. And and you mentioned the um, the AIDS community and the LGBTQ community, and they are grieving every day as well. 
Many of them have lost families over this or parents right. or siblings and, and friends even. So, you know, they're grieving. I honestly believe in deep in my soul, everyone is grieving. They may yeah. not realize it, but every one of us is grieving. And I think that is accounting for the trend that I'm seeing, certainly, in more and more podcasts about grief, <laughs> more and more books about grief, just in general, it's becoming a very common topic to mm -hmm. discuss. Well, and that's a good thing, you know, it's absolutely, you know, and not just grief in general, but the parts of grief that we really don't talk about, like anger. Right. Um, and I think that, you know, there are a number. In the research for this book, I've been reading several memoirs by members of the medical community who are on the front lines, and they're just horrific. They're just horrific. But I'm glad they're writing them. I'm glad they started writing them so soon that they didn't wait 20 years like Vietnam vets, right. or, you know, like you, exactly. you can't carry this around in you. Um, it's not healthy. For you or the people around you. Absolutely. Now, circling back again to friend grief. If you have lost a friend or friends, and you are feeling that no one is supporting you, no one recognizes that for you this was a huge, devastating loss, what do you suggest people do about that? How do they handle it? Um. It took a while after the pandemic started for me to lose a friend. And it was, there were two friends of my parents. And that first year, and then in 2021, there was actually the guy performed at my wedding, the orchestra leader. Um, he was the only one through the whole pandemic that I knew who died from COVID. And then starting with Christmas of 2021 until the end of 2022, I lost 12 friends. 12? Oh it started, the reason I started with that Christmas one is because I didn't find out until after the first of the year. Started with my dad's best friend and ended with my mom's best friend. And in between, there were you know, a couple guys I knew from ACT UP. There were a couple writers. An artist, you know, the woman who gave me my first theater job in Chicago, and one of my dearest friends from high school. I gave my first eulogy for her. Ugh. And, you know, for months we talked on the phone because I could not go visit her because of the restrictions. Right. Um, right. Where she was being treated, she could only have two visitors, not at a time, not. Overall, mm -hmm. two people, Just two, Jessica, period. her sister yep. and one of her brothers. Because my husband kept saying, don't you want to go visit her? I said, I can't. I can't go visit her. Yeah. You know, I don't know what floor she's on. Maybe I could stand outside the window. But, you know, I said, I can't even right. get inside the hospital. Yeah. And you can't get any information either. Right. You have no rights to information. Right. You have no standing. You just don't. And it was a very, and she's in the new book, <laughs> but she, she was a very private person. She never volunteered personal information about herself, but she knew everything about everybody. So that if you wanted gossip, it was all true and it wasn't malicious. But if you wanted to know about someone, she had a, she had a list and she had newspaper <laughs> articles to, you know, Back her up. I mean, she was great. And um, I guess so. she died in February. I guess it was that September before that in our phone call, she started telling me what she was going through at a level that I had not experienced with her since we met in 1966. Wow. And um, one other friend she also talked a lot to, not quite as much, but close. But we were sworn to secrecy. We couldn't tell anyone what she was going through or what she was feeling. And um, by the time she went into hospice at the beginning of February, I couldn't take it anymore. I mean, I, 
it, it felt like an actual physical weight on me. I'm sure. And so this other friend and I talked her into letting us notify our classmates. And um, because we, need, we needed to share this with other people who knew her as we did. So that's a roundabout way of getting to the answer of your question. I think mm -hmm. the most effective way, the most meaningful way when you feel alone is to reach out to other friends of the people, who, their friend who died. I didn't even appreciate at the time how much I needed that. And when I, I gave the eulogy at her funeral, it was the terrible, terrible winter weather. And there were only three members of our class there. It was live streamed, so you know, everyone could watch, but it wasn't the same. You know, It wasn't the same. So when we had our twice delayed 50th high school reunion in June, that's when I really felt that I could properly grieve for her, to be surrounded by other women who knew her and loved her as I did. Wow. Yeah, you've actually prompted me to think of some dear friends of mine that have died, not so recently, but, you know, I kind of recall some of, some of those similar feelings that, well, okay, I was grieving this person, but nobody seemed to recognize that fact that they were special to me or that I cared about them a certain way. And it would have been nice to just sit down, I guess, and swap memories. Um, and when you mentioned the class, that's exactly the type of group that you could do that with. Well, anyway, you know, she, she worked on every one of our reunions and we had a lot. And our last phone conversation was in January. And I said, at some point toward the end of the conversation, I said, I don't want to go to the reunion without you. She said, well, I don't want you to. But she died a month later. And oh. I was actually better able to grieve at the reunion than at her funeral. Mm -hmm. And I, I did not realize how much I needed that. Right. That helped you process. Well, and, and it, you know, it gave me permission is what it did. You know? Permission for what? To grieve without restrictions, I guess, without feeling, oh, I need to, you know, not fall apart. I need to not cry, you know, all this right. stuff. And I mean, certainly when I was giving the eulogy, my biggest fear was I was going to lose control. And I almost did. Absolutely. And I had to get through that. I didn't have that at the reunion. And one, one of the traditions of our reunions is that it's a Catholic girls high school. And um, we have a mass or a prayer service on Sunday. Right. And at some point, we bring up a rose for every girl from our class who has died. Uh -huh. And um, they asked me to bring up Christie's. And, mm -hmm. and I was okay with that. I mean, it didn't upset me. It didn't make me sad. I was like, okay, I can do that. And um, I walked up. I put the rose in the vase. I walked back and sat down. And my friend Judy grabbed my hand and squeezed really tight, and I just lost it. And it was the first time I, I really had, you know. And normally, you know, <laughs> sobbing in front of other people, you know, I would apologize and try to stop. But I didn't because I knew I didn't have to. You didn't need to because everybody there was feeling it too. It was that safety, you know. Right, right. Yeah. I honestly don't know how you could deliver a eulogy and not fall apart. That would be my greatest fear. I have given one eulogy and it was pretty rocky. I will say that. Yeah, that's it's a difficult thing to do. And, and I mm -hmm. applaud anyone who can stand up there and, and give a eulogy. Well, you know, the, uh, the getting up and giving it part, the technical part, I wasn't worried about. I have two degrees in theater. I know how to use a microphone. I know where to look at the camera. <laughs> It's, and I knew it was being live streamed. So, you know, I knew yeah. what to do. I was packing to go down to St. Louis for the funeral when her sister texted me and said, the family would be honored if you gave the eulogy. And my th first thought was, oh, hell no, I'm not doing that. 
<laughs> and exactly because I'm like I, I just want to be able to get through the phone. Right, right. And I, I argued with myself for about an hour, and then I finally said, okay. And I spent two days in my hotel room <laughs> practicing this, and I knew I could get to like this one point almost at the end before my voice cracked. Uh-huh. Yeah. So when I got up to do it, I felt pretty okay because the priest who gave the homily was a friend of hers from college. Actually knew her. Okay. They were friends. He All gave right. a beautiful homily. I thought, great lead in. Thanks, Bobby. You know? uh-huh. I started to talk and my voice cracked on the first sentence. And I thought, okay, this is not good. <laughs> And not a good start. This is not a good start. <laughs> and um, by the time I got to the part where my voice usually cracked, I was really struggling. But I got through yeah. it, and I sat down and, and cried a little, but not you know, not like I did at the reunion. Wow. It's interesting to me how a family will ask someone to do a eulogy but that fa- same family may not recognize at the funeral or for some special event honoring that person mm-hmm. that that person that they would ask to do a eulogy needs to also be invited. Is that common? You know, once I talk myself into doing it, mm-hmm. I was really honored that she asked. Well, sure. I mean, it could have been, it could have been other people. You know, it was, sure. you know, Christy was one of those rare people you never, ever heard anyone say anything negative about her. She excelled at friendship. Yeah. So any number of people could have done it. And I don't, you know, I, like I said, I'm, I was so glad to be included. Yeah. Well, sadly, Victoria, our time is winding down. So before we wrap up, I want to do for you what, I do for all of our guests, and that's to turn the microphone over to you without me leading you with questions or comments and just letting you speak directly to our listeners. Let them know more about you. Tell them certainly about this new book that will be coming out soon. Let them know as well about your other books or, well, anything you'd like them to hear. So it's your turn. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, The book I'm currently working on is called What Our Friends Left Behind, Grief and Laughter in a Pandemic. I don't have COVID in the title because I guess Amazon doesn't like COVID in the book titles. Oh. It sort of tags them as conspiracy theory books, which this is not, obviously. (laughs) Um, But I think the title says a lot about what's in the book. They are stories of people whose friends died during COVID, lots of different causes of death. Some are co-workers, a lot are co-workers in different industries, not just medical personnel who wound up taking care of their colleagues, but last responders, a phrase I had not heard before COVID. Last responders. Last responders, funeral workers, morgue attendants, medical examiners who were taking care of people in their community who they knew, Um, Broadway performers um, who lost their jobs for 15 months, not just a few months, in addition to their friends, people in religious communities whose faith was, was tested during this pandemic. But there is laughter in there, too. I promise there is. Um, it's, someone said, oh, that's depressing. Like, People need to understand that grief is not, grief is sad, but it's not depressing. Mm-hmm. What would be depressing is if you were not able to feel the grief, I think. Right. So you can learn about that book, about the Friend Grief series, about my book about straight women in the AIDS community, on my website, which is victorianoe.com, V I C T O R I A N O E. You can sign up for my newsletter. You can get the books in paperback or e-books, the, the AIDS book also in audio, wherever you get your books. 
including libraries. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I look forward to talking more about the stories in the new book. I do a lot of public speaking, and which I enjoy, obviously. But it's I you know, I hope you will read these books in the spirit that they were written, which is my philosophy of writing. I didn't know I had a philosophy of writing until someone asked me what it was. And my philosophy is these stories need to be told. And the more people talk about the grief they feel for their friends, the love they have for their friends, and why those friendships shape their lives, I think the more respect we'll get for them. I couldn't agree more. I could not agree more. Well said. Do you have any idea when your new book will be out this year? Um, I'm looking at um, around June 9th. Okay. All right. Well, I personally am going to keep an eye out on Amazon for it and make sure that copy slides its way onto my bookshelf <laughs> along you. with the Friend Grief series. Which I'm going to go grab right away <laughs> <laughs> because uh, one of the books in your Friend Grief series is about the military. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And uh, my husband was retired Army, and I remain involved with the uh, local chapter of Vietnam Veterans. Mm -hmm. So I have a lot of military friends. And unfortunately, we're all aging out. You know, it's mm -hmm. just uh, we're getting older and older. And each meeting I go to, I see fewer and fewer people. So that was the first book in the series I wrote where I did not have a personal connection. And I was really worried about it it being authentic. And I got the best feedback on it. So. Uh, yeah, well, I, you know, having met you, I cannot find any reason to think anything you write would not be. Oh, authentic thank you. Because you, you are just that kind of person. Thank you. So to our listeners, sadly, it's time to say farewell again. As always, we have to mention in the last few minutes, self-care, it's very important as you grieve, whether you are grieving for a friend whether you are grieving for many friends, loved ones in your family, blood family, extended family, or whether you're grieving a part of your life that has gone missing or that you're just not seeing the future as you saw it before. Whatever the reason, you first have to take care of yourself. We use the analogy like they do on the planes that if those oxygen masks drop out of the ceiling, Grab yours first, because if you don't save yourself, then you cannot reliably rescue anyone else. So take care of yourselves, and we hope you will join us for our next episode as well, as we all continue to live in grief. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover, or do you have a question from one of our episodes? please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.